Welcome to the Untrapped Podcast, Podcast, where we give motivational and inspirational tips about life, small business, wisdom, health, wealth, finance, relationships. relationships. It's about being the best, best you that you can possibly be. Possibly be, 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 be. Hashtag Untrapped. Welcome, well, welcome to the Untrapped Podcast. 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 I am your host, Keith Kelfus. Really good marketing is it's invincible. It just literally bypasses the critical mind and goes into the subconscious mind. When you can get your marketing to that point on your websites with your videos and everything that's happening to when people see it, they just go, oh, I must be in the right place. I just want to tell you a story. It was 2015 and I woke up in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. like literally sweating and having a panic attack. I was dripping in sweat and I was really paranoid because I realized that my videos had hit 100,000 views a month online on, on YouTube and I jumped on my laptop like with bags under my eyes and this is in the middle of the full-blown season so this you know 70 hours a week and I went on and frantically started putting all of my videos on private, deleting videos, going on my Facebook page, deleting everything I could. And in a type of panic attack like this, you realize that if you want to like uninstall your Facebook or delete the account, it's really actually hard to do. It'll keep reactivating it over time. And then you start thinking about like, oh my God, like everything I'm doing, the government's looking at me. You can go through these massive paranoia, almost like schizophrenia and start thinking, I've opened up a Pandora's box and I've permanently destroyed my reputation. People are going to think everything about me from, you know, I'm the biggest douche in the world to uh, I'm completely unprofessional. All of these, these type of things will uh, come in that have come into our head since childhood from different sources or even seeing our parents afraid or shying away from being on camera. This has instilled kind of a file in the back of our subconscious minds that oh my God, maybe I shouldn't be on camera because I'll look bad. And we create meaning out of that. So this all came out of me at once, once I hit that tipping point of 100,000 views. But mostly it was because I realized that my entire YouTube channel was a massive liability. I had like 100 videos of me on my customers' properties, their street signs, their addresses, their license plates, their backyards. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And I got on the phone with a friend who's a fellow YouTuber at that time who was getting even more views than I. And I, I called him up at three in the morning. We, we had this like panic attack together. He's like, oh my God, what if, what if, what if like Mrs. Jones' nephew sends the video to her and says, uh, you gotta see this. And it's a video with 50,000 views. And the lady's like, that's my kid's swing set. That's my barbecue grill. Like they would freak out and get on the phone with their attorney. And next thing you know, you get a cease and desist letter or you're in a, a, maybe in a courtroom. You don't know what people have, uh, possibly what they're into, what's in their basements, what their past is like, or how paranoid they might be. So all this came up at once. And so I started frantically deleting the videos and I realized that I couldn't do it myself. And I had to drop about $1,000 and hire a virtual assistant to go on YouTube for I don't know, it took two weeks straight and go through and manually watch every video and scrub out, blur out, cut out every address, every street sign, any personal information about clients. And that type of fear drove me into creating media release forms, being fully transparent about filming on customers' properties, figuring out what the laws are of media, what is the 12-foot rule. Like if you're filming, if somebody's 12 feet or farther behind you, they're just background people. If they're closer than 12 feet, they need you need their permission, at least verbally. If they're actually part of the film, then in, in the rules of media, we're in a gray area, but you need a written consent, uh, a media release form, okay? Unless it's like, this is a media production, it's okay, you know what I'm doing. But just, I'm talking about the public, right? I learned that if you're filming on someone's property, what can Google Maps see? Well, now it can see everything with Google Earth, but it's, it's the rule, what can you see from the street view? If you go into their backyard, now you're on their private property with a camera, and that's you know technically against media law. So I became very transparent with the client. I learned a lot of these laws, and I started 
coming up with scripts and ways that I could ask my clients if it's okay to film on their property. So 30% of all my videos and all the content or more was gone within a two week period. And I started self correcting and course correcting. And in that time, it was what, 2015, I had just enough money to save up for the winter. The spring was coming and I realized I couldn't afford a lawsuit. I couldn't afford any of that at that time. So I think that those type of fears get you involved in doing things on the more up and up. So we created the media release forms. I started telling the clients, I said, Mrs. Jones, um, please check this box if you do not want us to do any filming for maybe our Facebook page for advertising. In the, this whole new world of uh, online media and social media marketing, it's becoming more and more popular that uh, service business owners, whether you know it or not, are gonna be maybe taking pictures of your property. So, and some of the customers, to my surprise, were like, absolutely not. Like we're like we're attorneys. We don't, we're, we're lawyers. Like we might put people in jail or something, <laughs> but they didn't want that. And I was glad I started becoming transparent because I learned. Now we've enrolled the the digital media release form directly, and I explain it to all the clients. And if we don't film on their property, because we don't do it on every property, maybe once a week now, they um, they'll ask, "What is this? What is all this verbiage? And why why sign here?" I say, oh, that's just if we do marketing and media advertising for our business, but we didn't do any of that here. So they go, okay, so, but that was a huge learning lesson. I wanna refer, because I get really, really passionate about this. <laughs> One second. So that's what I learned and I wanna show that to you guys today. If, if you're concerned about that at all, then you should definitely look into that. Get a media release form and be very transparent about it because there's absolutely a new way. There's a whole new thing that's happening and it's been happening for years now. There's some people that knew it was coming, but you still have a lot of time to get in as being a pioneer in this whole new media, social media distribution model of, of information, of marketing, video marketing, that you can actually create videos with your cell phone that are highly valuable to your clients, your prospective clients. And you can use that to market your business at uh, almost, almost nothing to zero advertising costs. And you can, leverage yourself in the marketplace to create value that 99% of the rest of your competition isn't doing. So the people that are gonna win, and you really need to pay attention to this right now because this is a, a ship that's here and it's, it's moving. You have to pay attention to this. This is extremely vital because the people who are gonna win in this new social media marketing paradigm are the people who are actively learning how to market their businesses. Like I believe all marketing should be self-taught before you hand it off to somebody else so you understand what's going on. But the people who win are the people who are gonna be implementing this. And I believe it's gonna be service business owners that either themselves or somebody on their team are actively becoming what uh, Gary Vaynerchuk calls a, you're a media company for, company first, and Joe knows what I'm talking about. And second, you are an actual service business. So it's, it's a two-fold theory. It's you have a media business now that is also your service business, and then you're documenting the systems, the processes, the marketing, whether it's just you on a cell phone talking about what you're doing, and putting that out there as content constantly on a consistent basis so you rise above all the noise of all of your competition. When you do this and you get good at it and you do it more and more often than everybody else, you'll smoke them. You'll actually, you, you will destroy the competition and develop a, a blue ocean strategy, which is doing something totally, well, it, soon it will, it, it will be a red ocean. I say 10, 15 years, but now you can have a blue ocean strategy, which is to do something that nobody else is doing because a lot of them, it's not integrated into their habits. It's not something that, they're even comfortable doing. So those who fail are the people obviously that won't do it. Those who fail, uh, we're gonna have to spend a lot more money on marketing and advertising into the future while everybody else is uh, driving their, their, their marketing costs down by doing it. So I've got 7.5% uh, of the gross annual revenue in my business was marketing and advertising, I've got it all the way down to one and a half to 2% just by specifically doing search engine optimization strategies, blog posts, uh, posting on Google and creating videos, video marketing, embedding it in blog posts, and just doing this in the morning before I go to work a couple times a week. It's driven us up to being the, uh, the number one service provider in our whole city for landscaping and for window cleaning. 
and our customers see our videos. They call, I say, how did you hear about our services? And some of the customers actually say, oh, I, I was looking for a landscaper, or we do landscaping and window cleaning. And they said, oh, and I saw your video, and then you were talking. I'm like, which, which video was it? You know, Because obviously I don't want the customers to see my other videos, and I separate that because sometimes I talk about stuff I don't want the customers to hear. But sometimes they actually see the videos, and then it builds a relationship with them before they even uh, decide to call other people. They call us up and then we go out and then you actually show up on the door uh, step if you're the sales guy doing the video as the guy. So you've already made that connection and you've built that rapport. So using these are preemptive strategies to, to start putting your stake in the ground now and building this, this media as a routine into the calendar of your marketing calendar of your business. So uh, if you pick a specific day of the week that you start doing this, say, okay, every single Wednesday, I'm going to shoot, oh, excuse me, I'm going to shoot a video about the business or about what we're doing about our services for our clients. When you build it in, then it becomes habit and it hits automaticity. So just like, like Joe was saying yesterday, this, this has to become habit, just like the way that you pick up the phone, just like the way you present yourself to the client, the way you write up the work order, is the same way that you start doing media actively in your business. Well, you know, why should I listen to this Keith Kelfis guy? I, um, <laughs> because some of you make more money than me. So a lot of you actually have bigger businesses than I do. But you should listen to me because uh, in my journey of learning how to do all this, and I've made a lot of mistakes, my videos hit, I think, uh, 15,000, I mean, 15 million views now or across eight different YouTube channels. And now it's, it's quantifying and it's hitting about a million views a month, all my posts on the internet. And I've learned a ton of stuff. And it's also created uh, nine different streams of passive income on the digital media side, just by posting, by being uh, sponsored by different tool companies, by writing and publishing books and information products, and especially YouTube. YouTube pays me money. So it's become a deep passion of mine to actually share the things that I've learned and I'm learning because now I implement them into my actual service business and I'm seeing actual tangible and financial results by doing it. So I want to teach you something called the anti-guru effect. A lot of people are nervous to shoot videos because you feel like you have to be the best. If you grew up watching... TV commercials, which we all have, of guys being super polished, and the whole commercial is is just like, like wow, I, I can't do that. I don't even have the budget or the training or the understanding how to do that. So you might try to shoot a video, and you get kind of like panicky, and you'll shut the phone off. Oh, who, who here has tried to shoot a video before or done any of this? Have you ever gotten frustrated and you kept doing it over and over and over? Yeah, you got a new phone. So you threw your phone. <laughs> so the anti-guru effect, it actually works for you in your favor because you don't have to be the expert. Here, here's an example of the anti-guru effect. If let's just say, God forbid, you're, you're going through a bankruptcy and you're looking online for information about how to deal with the bankruptcy. And you, in one video you pull up, it's a guy who's in a, a three-piece suit. He's an attorney and he's giving you advice about uh, bankruptcy and bankruptcy law. Call his number and hire him. So you go to the next video and then there's a guy who's like literally just coming out the back end of his bankruptcy and he's saying, uh, guys, uh, my, my name is Joe. I went through a bankruptcy. I went through hell. I'm coming out the, you know, the back end of it. And it was really, really painful but here's some amazing things I learned. Like it wasn't as expensive as I thought and I was able to find this loophole. And if a guy's talking like that on a video, you might tune right in and listen to what he's saying because he's a guy who's actually going through the journey and through the process. So he's relieved of having to be some type of guru or having to be some super polished guy because now he's just being authentic and genuine. And I really believe if you make videos and create content that positions yourself as uh, a service uh, a service provider who actually genuinely cares, instead of trying to be some type of guru, you're literally just trying to serve your client and talk to them and give them just a qualified, uh, credible information about how you can serve them. And you can say, and we're not perfect in the video, but we've learned a lot of things in our eight years in this. And we learned specifically if we, if we clean the carpet like this, or we maintain the property like this, we can get this awesome result that's drastically different than everybody else. So has anybody ever seen uh, Billy Mays with the Kaboom Cleaners commercials back in the day? Yeah. 
So how did I learn all this video marketing and search engine optimization strategies? Aside from being obsessed and running around with the camera since I was a kid, in 2011 when I started my business, we had an eviction notice on the door. My wife and I were up all night stressing out over money issues. I had left a dead end job and was still stuck in the nine to five mindset. I didn't know anything about marketing or advertising, didn't have any money to invest in it. And all I knew is that it cost a bunch of money. So I drove deep and quick, going to uh, Amazon, use books, going to the bookstore, looking on YouTube, trying to find as many low cost and no cost ways to market and advertise your business as possible. Has anybody else ever done that? Okay, so, and I started learning that with the internet and internet marketing, there's something called search engine optimization. You can do very specific things to rise yourself to the top of the search engines to get on page one of Google. Has anybody here ever had companies call them claiming they can get you on page one of Google and trying to, does anybody pay for it? No. Nobody pays for it? That's interesting to me. Nobody pays for what? Nobody signs up for their service? Yeah. Are there any services that call you that specifically yeah, that I, you do I, sign up with? I hired a guy. But. Do you see you hired somebody in-house? Yeah, but I pay a lot of money for SEO. So you pay a company to do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do they give you results? Um, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's all right. And how much you pay a month for it? Uh, like five hundred dollars a month. Okay. Yeah. So I make fifty, but I get another little. He does the video <laughs> stuff too. But. I think that's a good deal, because now with, uh, I mean, print media and advertising still works, but with internet marketing, you can bring it in-house. You can start out by doing it yourself and then eventually uh, hire somebody else to do it. But you can do it a couple hours a week by learning how to create blog posts, which say uh, three common mistakes homeowners make when hiring a carpet cleaning company for the first time. Or doing something to position your company as, as an expert in your industry by creating an, an article that's tagged locally to your local, your local service area, your target demographic, about uh, a case study story about a client who got their, their, their carpet was trashed and dirty with before and after pictures of the result that you got them. When I talked about Billy Mays and results in advance, if you do this and you create videos, let's say you create five before and after videos specifically of like you're literally on a property you're pointing the camera at the carpet you're showing the carpet fil filthy with grape juice stains and you clean it it's clean or you take a video montage you create of before and after pictures of dirty and clean carpet and you create these videos once you get one that's really good and it communicates the message well of the before and after effect to your client you can literally take that video and em embed it inside of your website and then turn it into a blog post. And then when you send that to your customers, now you're showing them results in advance. Uh, have you ever gotten frustrated and you say, damn it, I wish I had a cloning machine? Yeah. So you can, so I was obsessed with that fact. And I realized even though you can't personally clone your own physical body to do labor, you can actually use video to clone yourself and build relationships with people on autopilot uh, all over your, your, your local demographic, your city, your country, or even all over the world. So if you think of it in terms as a cloning machine and leverage, and that other people are doing that and they're catching on to that, to me it's an emergency to start doing this because now the, le the leverage, the quantified efforts of what's happening is you'll be left at, uh, in the dust if you don't do that. So imagine if you had videos online, local, locally tagged to you, uh, on your YouTube channel to your, your city, and also on your website and sending them out in the email marketing campaigns to your clients. But these videos are, are you selling to your clients and building relationships with them. It's literally a cloning machine because now where you're out actually working or you're on the wand or you're answering the phone or you're doing other things, you have all these videos that are actually selling and building relationships with all of your customers literally on autopilot. So you've cloned yourself in a sense. And this is absolutely fascinating to me because you can bring them down a line and build an entire relationship with them to the point to now they're just ready to buy and buy from you now. You've walked them down the buying process from maybe potentially being cold all the way to warm to hot and ready to buy now. And you actually didn't have to physically be there or on the phone with them and walk them through that process because it's being done through videos. So if you do that and you do it consistently, uh, anybody here familiar with funnels or funnel marketing, click funnels? Yeah. 
Okay, so that's how you're driving people through the funnel and bringing them to the point where you're only dealing with people who are ready to buy right now. If you can warm up that process faster and use video marketing to do that, that's how, that's how it works. And if you do it and do it more often than anybody else, you absolutely will dominate. I want you to create a YouTube channel and start making at least one video per week about your, your, your service business. You selling to the client as much as saying hi, I'm Joe with Joe's Carpet Cleaning, and we're literally cleaning carpets right now. And if you need anything, put the number on the screen, click the link in the description below, go to our website, and schedule your carpet cleaning now. To another video, which is results in advance, creating videos of the before and after of the finished product for your customers. And then also case study videos of you talking to your clients and telling them a story about another client who had success with your company. Oh, we had a client named Mrs. Jones, and it, it, it was it was crazy. We, we went in the house, and it was just covered with stains all over the place. And we were there an extra hour, but we have this special solution, and we were able to completely clean it and make it amazing. And here's a picture, and put it right on the video. If you do that, and you do enough videos, and you get to the point where you get some really good ones, you can actually embed that on your website and send that to your customers. You can take those videos, and you can actually put them on your YouTube, I mean, your, your Facebook page, so you can syndicate the content, which I mean is you can, you can take a video for YouTube and upload the same exact video to Facebook. And if you get a good one that has engagement, you can boost that with ads to your local service area. And now your customers will actually start to see these videos. So when they're scrolling on their, their timeline and on their feed, your company will pop up with a button to click to book you right now. Okay. Who here collects their customers' email addresses? That's awesome. You can actually upload the email addresses directly inside of Facebook of your customers, and then it will serve ads on their timelines. So it's a, it's a beautiful way to market. You can also create a lookalike audience. It'll find people with the same, the psychographic, the demographic, geographic, their financial stats, like uh, where they live, how much money they make, how many kids they have. And you can actually market to people that have the same exact criteria of the people that already uh, you serve, your customer avatar, your perfect customer. So if you do that, uh, does anybody here actually actively use Facebook ads? Just ready to watch. One or two. Cool. Anybody here watch Gary Vaynerchuk? Yeah. Cool. So you can actually get uh, attention of your target market for extremely cheap by doing this. So if video and video marketing is free, and then you use other low cost strategies, you can get in front of a massive audience of people and communicate and build relationships with them on autopilot. And then more customers are calling ready to buy. You're gonna make about a hundred crappy videos before they start to get good. And I think it's important to upload them unless they're really bad. It's, it's important to upload them anyways. It's important to go on Facebook Live on your business page while you're out working and, and kind of share your day because when your customers see that, they will get to know you and you'll also start to get good at it coming into the future. But your first 100 videos are probably gonna suck. And it's important to get through that process as soon as possible to the point where they actually start to get good. Uh, I wanna kind of share with you my video content syndication strategy and how it works for me now. So if I plan out a video of how I, I want it to be and shoot the video, I'll take the actual video, upload it to YouTube, tag it and title it in my whole local demographic area. So what is your zip code? Like carpet cleaners near me. If I was, if I do window cleaners in Shelby Township, 48044, I tag and title everything with the website in the video, then upload it to Facebook, okay? In my media business, I take that video and I send it to, uh, well, I actually have a, a video editor in Russia. So all the videos that I shoot, I just send all the footage to him on Dropbox and then he edits all the videos and then it's done. So I have another virtual assistant in the Philippines who takes the, the video and embeds it in a blog post, transcribes everything I said, reformats it and turns it into a blog post with a click uh, link that goes back to my website. Then I have another virtual assistant in the States that she takes the videos and extracts the audio from it, edits it and turns it into a podcast and uploads it to eight different podcast platforms, including iTunes, SoundCloud, Spreaker, all that. And then I have another virtual assistant who's 
answering the comments and moderating and doing reputation management as well. So you can have an entire team of people working for you syndicating all this content for as little as, I don't know, 10 bucks an hour all over the world. Has anybody here ever used Upwork.com? What? You do? What do you what do you do on Upwork? Uh, not about, not about. I work. You. I, I worked on Upwork when I was contacting. Back oh, so you were actually a freelancer. Yeah, I was doing. So that's that's very cool. So. Is this like Fiverr? It's it's like Fiverr, but it's a more professional, higher qualified version of Fiverr. And I've used Fiverr too. If you want to do what I'm doing, uh, talking about very cheaply, and you want to hire people to help you market your business, it's f i v e r r dot com. Uh, I got sick of Fiverr. I started using Upwork.com. It's it was Elance and Odesk, and they kind of merged and created Upwork. So you can go and hire extremely professional people that charge you up to two hundred dollars an hour to write the copy on your website. So when customers read it. They literally, it just, it makes perfect sense to them and it converts and it makes sense. They want to buy now. Uh, I have a, a, an event happening in three weeks and I'm thinking about pulling the trigger and just dropping a few hundred bucks and hiring a, an amazing copywriter to reformat and fix the copy on the website so it makes a lot more sense to people. I believe it's absolutely worth it because it's a system. You talk about system and systems thinking, the marketing is a system in itself. If you can get all this syndication happening and get it so it's very fluid, because really good marketing is, it's invincible. You don't know what's happening. It just literally bypasses the critical mind and goes into the subconscious mind. When you can get your marketing to that point on your websites with your videos and everything that's happening to when people see it, they just go, oh, I must be in the right place. It becomes the obvious choice. Like they don't wanna go anywhere else. Because now when they've landed on your website or they've seen your video, this feeling comes through them of trust and they go, oh, I'm in the right place because it looks official. If you can get that or hire people to help you get that for very cheap on say something like Upwork.com, you can now you can use that, that as marketing leverage to dominate your competition. So, it, it, And a lot of this is it's kind of walk a mile, see a mile. And when you, you've done it so much, you look back and it makes perfect sense and you don't want to do anything else. I do want you guys to actually start a YouTube channel. If you have a Gmail account, download the YouTube app and literally start shooting videos on properties. Say I'm going to do this every single Wednesday. I was going to give you guys a 30 day challenge to say you have to make a video literally every single day, even if it's only 30 seconds long, but that's kind of hard to do when you first get started. But at least once a week, I want you to make a video and upload that thing. Don't be worried about uh, looking stupid because nobody's going to watch it anyways. A week will go by and it'll have like two views and it would be like you and your my mom. Your mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the really cool thing about it is nobody sees the videos anyways. So let's do it. Four week challenge, one video a week. I'm up for it. Everybody up yeah, for that? that? Absolutely. That, that would be mm -hmm. that's doable. Mm -hmm. that's extremely doable. Yeah. And like I said, the, the Billy Mays method, the results in advance, you can literally just make a video. We're on this job. We're cleaning this carpet. I'm Joe with Joe's Carpet Cleaning. This is what we're doing. Look, before and after, if you need anything done, click the link in the description below and then practice going in the tags and the titles, the description inside of YouTube and, excuse me, put your website links, all your, your social media pages for your business, your phone number, everything so they can easily just get to you and pick up the number. Uh, I mean, pick up the phone and call you. If you do that and you do it enough, it'll start to populate and percolate in the search engines. I can get into white hat and black hat SEO. It's a long, like 20 hour topic. But if you do that and do it enough, it'll start to populate in the search engines. And it's just one more modality, one more thing that customers can find you easier and faster and get to you so they can pick up the phone and hire you. So when you post that to YouTube or Facebook and your numbers on there and your websites on there, it is going to, that's a modality, what you're talking about there. It's repopulating. And so every time it's just one more tick mark. If you don't have the phone number or web page on that, it's not going to count. Oh, so it sounds like, and we are totally going into Q and A mode now. Like okay. I've just literally condensed all that down in a half an hour. Yeah, so backlinks is like the heart of the internet. Building backlinks in 
search engine optimization strategy or Google search to get on search engine ranking page, the backlinks that you build, which is the HTTP S semicolon forward slash forward slash www.yourwebsite.com. When you have that, your social media pro, uh, profiles, you're taking uh, trusted authority sites. If your site is, if it's if it's a secure domain, it's authorized. If you're paying for uh, SSL security, and then you also have that your your website embedded. This is kind of hard to explain. I hope you guys can follow me. If you embed your website URL and you put it inside of Facebook, which is an authority site, you put it inside of LinkedIn, you put it everywhere, then they, it links back and it creates a huge inter interconnecting spider web that everything's leading back to your website. The more times you put your link in YouTube videos, you put it on Facebook, you put it all over the place, and people do it also, is you can get somebody to share your stuff, is the more authority that it gives your website. And then when it does that enough times over about a year, Google will index it. When it indexes, it will start to build uh, momentum and raise it up the search engines. There's something called keyword density, but putting the keywords over and over in everything that you do that are similar to the keywords that your customers would type in when they're looking for your service. So if you're matching those keywords and you're creating content with the specific type of keywords, like if you read a blog post article about carpet cleaning and they're all the things that you're mentioning it, if you look at, look at it through the kind of the x-ray eyes of somebody who understands SEO, you're like, wow, this is a keyword rich blog post that is very well written. And when you, when you do that enough, you'll, you will grab, uh, gravitate and you'll move up the search engines and you'll get to page one of Google. You can do it within a year. So questions, any questions? I'm dying to hear more about the books that you wrote. Like, mm -hmm. Did you write those and self-publish, or did you go? How did that work? Uh, the book thing is, you hear a lot of people when you're growing up. A lot of people run their mouth and say that, "Oh, I'm writing a book," or "I'm going to write a book," right. and. I felt the same way. Well, I was like, well, screw that. I'm actually going to write a book. So in 2016, I, I leased an office space. I mean, it was 2015. Time flies. And I knew that I needed to lease that space to write a book because I couldn't do it at home. I had dogs and cats jumping all over me. And my wife asked me, you know, what's for dinner? And so I would eat dinner with her. And then I would go lock myself in that office till five, six, seven, eight, nine in the morning. And I wrote a book and self-published it on Amazon's Create Space. Great. And then I kind of took some best-selling books and I modeled the, the designs that were converting the most. And then I created all my own. I taught myself how to use Photoshop and edited the book like six times down. And then I sent it off for samples. It was like a, a four-month process. When the book came back and it was right, it was good. Then I, I published it and I hit the gas on it and started promoting it. And it probably sold like, that book must have sold 3,000 copies. It was called How to Start a Landscaping Business Right Now with No Startup Money. So then I also created a, a studio with a booth and I uh, spoke the whole book and uploaded it to audible.com. So it's for sale on Audible now as well. And then, so it's an ebook, it's a paperback book, and it's an audio book. So all three of those. I created a video course about how to start a landscaping business. So that's an information product. It's just an entire package that people buy. It's uh, the window cleaning blueprint. It's called how to make $500 a day cleaning windows. So same thing. This book was a little bit better than the previous book because I was learning, but I locked myself in my office for another two weeks and just typed my ass off until I was like literally sleeping on the floor of my office. And I published that, a bunch of people complaining because there was misspellings and stuff, and I had edited that like six times as well. And so I had to actually hire, no, it was a YouTube fan in exchange for coaching. He went through and edited and formatted the entire book and made it gorgeous. And that one sold another 3,000 copies. So I, I think I made $70,000 off the two books and the audiobooks, and they sell on autopilot just constantly, even right now. So I get... Uh, uh, royalty checks from Amazon.com, from Audible.com, and from like all these different income sources. I need to do more of that, but did I answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. So anything else? Any other questions about video marketing, SEO? So I was just wondering, um, 
how do you pre-plan it or how far ahead do you go? I mean, do you script it out or do you just go, oh, I'm going to write about, you know, how I'm going to do Windows and how to get people started in that business? When you say writing, are you talking about doing actual blog posts? No, no, no. I just mean like for yourself before you start filming it. Obviously, now you're at a point where you can just on the fly have a great idea, spark, go and start filming or go on live. But in terms of like when you began, were you like, oh, okay, today I'm going to talk about how to make $500 a day cleaning windows. Um, Tomorrow I'm going to do, you know, five common mistakes that window cleaners make. Um, How did you kind of get that flowing? So in the beginning, everything was off the cuff and it was a I used to say there's masculine and there's feminine. Masculine is structure and energy, I'm speaking. Feminine is just flow. I was more on the feminine side of like literally just making anything that came up in my head. But I, I hit a plateau and I couldn't scale that because it was always on the fly. There was no structure. There was nothing I could bring anybody else on and collaborate with. When And, and then I started following a guy by the name of Brendan Burchard and I've invested probably $10,000 in his programs and his courses. And he has something called Experts Academy, High Performance Academy. So if you fast forward that seven, eight years, my basement now, which is a whole like media room, I literally have bought these huge... Now, now you can do this on a software called like Asana or Trello. You can create it all on digital dashboards, which is really great. I like the actual physical thing. So I have... You can go to the dollar store and pick up uh, the white boards... (laughs) and literally tape them all over your walls and get sticky notes that are of all different colors. And then every time you get good ideas, track a list of the different pieces of content you want to create. So sit down once a year and create a content marketing calendar and break it up into quarters, break it up into months, and break it up into seasons based on what's going on in your industry and what you want to talk about. Then write those all down. So I have quadrants and columns of all the different ideas from what needs to be done on the web- website to product development to the service business to video marketing to blog posts, what needs to be assigned to virtual assistants. What goes on here, it's just an entire category list physically across the entire walls. So I take the different colored post-its and I write, uh, this one is YouTube video ideas and there's a column and it fits two this all makes sense, right? Yeah. Okay, so, and I write, okay, uh, five tips before starting a landscaping business. If it's for your service business, before and after video of carpet cleaning, stick the sticky note on the wall. And then now, before you know it, you're building an entire, all these video ideas, so you're preloading content in, in the idea. So this is the conceptual level. Then if you have... On your content marketing calendar, every single Wednesday you make a video, you look at it in order of priority. You say, you know what, I'm gonna do this video. You know, what you don't take it, you 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 make that video, yeah. So you you structure out the video. You can learn a lot about this from like Michael Hag's The Hero's Two Journeys. There's so much stuff that you can learn about this, it's just mind-boggling, which I'm completely fucking obsessed with. <laughs> but so you make the video when the piece of content is done. Then you write a blog post when you make the video, then write a blog post article about it, okay? Then now you can embed the video in your blog and create a blog post. And when that piece of content's done, you take it from here and you move it to the done area. So now that's done. And if you see that and you look at it every day and if you have a team that's doing that as well, everybody can see what's going on because it's a huge organizational dashboard that's physical. And now people can actually go up and take, "Ah, got that done. Boom. And I look at over the months and now over the past year and a half that I've been doing this, I'm seeing all this stuff just getting syndicated and getting done. And it's it's cool. And I can do it at my own pace. So does that make sense? When you're first getting started, um, you could overwhelm yourself with pre-roll. You know, it's like if you're I don't know if you uh, you play in the um, the rap game. Right. If you if you. If, if you freestyle, the uh, eh, uh, like that's a perpetual loop I see most people get caught in. Just that pre start, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. So I think the best way to break the barriers, number one, forget about production quality. Your first year of video making is gonna blow. Eat that. 
Like, just know that. And that might be a little bit of some of the thing that some people think is charming that starts to build the affinity that then starts to provide you with the feedback over what do people really want to see. YouTube has some great analytics as far as like when people are dropping off. You can use those to then make sure that you're doing the things that keep people engaged. You're not going to know going in. I'm a big fan of state, right? State is how things that exist right now in the second. We are evolutionary beings. We are. You will not be the same person when you leave here today that you were when you showed up yesterday, right? We are constantly evolving. So coming, going into it going, I need to make a thing that has, because you said lackluster, and I'm like, awesome. Just keep doing it. The, l- the luster comes from the polish, right? And so continuing that over time. So just forget about production quality. As long as the audio is decent and you can hear and the video isn't blurry, then people are going to consume it. Like you guys don't even understand what's going on on Snapchat and freaking like all of these, you know, Vimo and like there's, there's, (laughs) I'm sure Keith and I are old school. We're behind the times. There's stuff that like 12 year olds and 13 year olds are using on the regular in scale by the millions, right? Those types of, and it's just, really crappy selfie type. And we say crappy. The quality of an iPhone or an Android is amazing. Point number two is don't produce, at least not for a good six months, document. It's a big mental shift. It's not like, oh, what are we going to do? No. Like you see people following Keith and I around. We're just documenting what's going on. If you have enough of that material, you can find the two-minute nugget that will get people's attention and keep your clients engaged. That is a different skill set, and it takes time, right? Because these guys, these poor guys got to go through, I mean, 16 hours of role at least, uh, and then over and over and over and over. And like every time they're refining and clipping out like the boring crap, right? So that's really what it comes down to, distilling via a documentation process as opposed to pre-production, planning, and then creation. You're not going to make a music video on your first shoot. Wait a year. Give yourself time before you do that. I want to add to what he's saying. Uh, An amazing marketer that I follow said, you eventually get to the point where you're just telling the truth. And if you think about that, it's, it's instead of like high production quality, you're just documenting the truth. And now because people are so used to seeing that and they like the authentic raw rawness, if they see something that's overproduced, it might have the opposite effect where they're turned off. I grew up around media guys. Quentin's one of my best friends and guys who shoot video and have owned media companies and wedding photography video companies. And uh, a friend a couple years ago, we did a project where we locked ourselves in the office for two days straight, 14 hours a day, and we just filmed this whole, this whole thing, right? And it took him like six months to edit it and get it all down. And he finally gave it to me after six months because he's a professional video editor, my, my friend. And I looked at it and I was like, dude, that was like six months ago. I made like 600 videos since then that have just reached hundreds of thousands of people, literally. And I looked at the production quality of the video. It was so good. And the whole thing was a big flop. I've spent, I have a video when we were in L.A., what is that, that uh, Rodeo Drive? Yeah, I'm on Rodeo Drive. We do this motivational video. Actually, I, I hired you and he came and he like filmed me crying on the floor and I was telling this whole dynamic story about uh, the struggle. The production quality was really, really uh, good for, for what it was. And the video got like 6,000 views. So the very next day I sit on my porch and I make a video talking about, I don't know, tips of starting a landscaping business, and it gets like 12,000 views in half the time. I'm like, whoa, what is going on here? So I think that putting out consistent content that is just authentic and extremely relevant to what's going on into your market in your marketplace and has a high relevancy score will just cut through all the noise and all the bullshit and through the mix. If you do that enough and you keep you know, creating videos, it will catch on in your local market because 
I, I send the videos to my customers if they have a, a question about the process of how we clean their windows. And I send them a video. It's me standing in a house that I got the customer's permission. I say, hi, I'm Keith with Kelfis Window Cleaning. And today I'm going to show you how we're different than other companies and how we actually clean the windows. Like we don't just skip over this. Come on. And I and I have I I'll open up the window and I'll show them how we're scrubbing out the tracks and I'm you know smiling with fucking bags under my eyes, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to reshoot that video because it's like I'm actually like, but anyways I send it to the customer now they can actually see the process of what's going on if they're like an OCD type clean freak customer so there's all types of things you can do like that to just pitch all these things at your customer that they can just watch on their tablet and get it. Any other question? I was wondering if you could talk about opportunities that have come to you because of the audience that you have and maybe even opportunities that you've turned down and, you know, that you didn't take up, like the sponsorships and partnerships and just maybe kind of talk about what was becoming available at a certain level of audience and then maybe now what's available to you now. That's a really good question and I've thought about this for a long time. Okay, so there's this thing that happens in your mind when you hit like 10,000 subscribers and people start kind of like walking up to you and noticing you at the mall or honking at you at red lights. And you start this little like thing that wants to be a celebrity when you're like a kid or whatever and you watch TV. You start like bullshitting yourself and thinking that you're somebody and you're trying to like live up to this thing. And it, it, it goes like this. And then you realize that this doesn't even make any sense because there's people who have millions of followers on, on the internet and it's usually only got 10,000 subscribers. And then you start becoming, and I'm getting exactly to what you're saying, but this ties into it. You start to become friends with other people who legitimately have those type of audiences and you realize they're just normal people who are just crazy and like to make a bunch of videos. But when you have this audience and all these views and you have those numbers underneath your videos, when companies and people see that, there's a percentage of people that look at that and something happens, either a dopamine drip happens and that means something to them or what they can get from it or a company sees that, oh my God, I could literally use this guy as a human marketing mechanism to get me results in my business. Large companies see the effectiveness of the type of marketing that you do and it's a huge leverage position for them right now as far as it's cheap. You know, you yeah. can get a hold of a you know, a higher or mid-level uh, influencer. And, you know, I'm, I know it's very effective for them. And I, I see the the dealings happening and, and things like that. So I was just curious of the back end of all that. And and it was more than I had thought. That was a lot. Yeah. I probably, I make four to 5,000 a month in passive income from the different streams. So I did 54,000 last year. I should do, uh, it, I'm on track to do, uh, the goal is 120,000 this year online from all the different income streams. So I have companies that I'm hooked up with that they send me like affiliate checks. I get Amazon affiliate links, paid from the books, the courses, YouTube pays me about, uh, I think it was 1,250 this month. But I have friends that are making from 10 to 30,000 to a uh, half a million dollars a month just off doing all this crazy stuff. So if I can be completely honest, five, six years ago when I started my service business, I never wanted to start a landscaping company because I did it my whole life. And I started seeing this whole digital media thing and what was happening. I said, this is going to be a long, hard road. But if I start digging and getting this flowing now, five years ago, and I put my whole heart and soul in it, I kept my wife and I trapped living in a piece of shit, one bedroom apartment, like for like four years it was bad we had neighbors that were like crackheads my brand new nike shoes got stolen off my doorstep and luckily nothing bad ever happened but like so i started building both businesses at the same time and after years i mean i went ninety thousand dollars in the hole building the youtube channel so it's finally starting to to pay off to where now i'm in the green but um and then also my credibility is only like this i haven't grown a million dollar business so Nobody that has a business that is uh, larger than mine, not nobody, is going to necessarily take business advice from me by watching my videos because it only goes so far. So that's where I'm stuck and I'm actually ripped in half right now. But I give you this whole long answer, but no, it's great. Yeah. And I just wanted to share that perspective. What about relationships? Have you, because of your audience, because of your following, because of you being exposed to people, people come to you that you've made relationships with that help you in life that otherwise you never would have made. Yeah, so I get access to the
the, all the top industry leaders, I literally can, I have all their phone numbers and I can call them and sit on the phone with them for an hour and get the highest level of life-changing advice all the time just because I have an audience and sometimes it feels like it's not even fair. Uh, there's one leader specifically that, there's something called a Dream 100 list. If you make a list of all the top people that you would love to be around and start going down and strategically building relationships with them over time on a timeline, eventually you're going to be having coffee with these people. You're going to be, you might even become best friends with these people. If you strategically figure out in advance who you want to be around, you can change your environment and change your life specifically. Well, there was... <laughs> There's a few internet marketers that I'm on their Dream 100 list, and I'm not even aware that these people are strategically becoming friends with me, hopefully genuinely, so they can just get to my audience. But the, the byproduct of that is invaluable friendships that have changed my, my, my life. So That's awesome. uh, Joshua Latimer, the Automate Grow Cell guy, in 2016, my marriage was falling apart because I was working over 90 hours a week. I became really cold. I was like in war mode and I, I wasn't paying attention to my marriage and my wife, I came home, she was like standing in the driveway crying. She wanted to go back to her mom's house. She wanted to like straight up divorce me because, and, and I, it, was, it just kind of blindsided me because I had the big excuse like, what are you talking about? I'm doing this so we can, you know, make it. And it was kind of all bullshit. I got on the phone with Joshua Latimer. This guy's married. He's got five kids. He's a Christian. We prayed together and he coached me and literally helped. Uh, I don't think I would ever get a divorce. You know, we just really helped repair that process and rekindle the love between my wife and I. And it's, it's, it's stuck permanently and our marriage has been amazing since then. And just because of the YouTube channel, I've had access to that guy and I could call him anytime and he'll coach me through something like that, you know? But, <laughs> sorry, I'm like super vulnerable right now. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. So, and just dovetailing on that, the very reason Keith is here, because I'm trying to help him in his journey, you know, become that speaker and kind of, I want him to build up his landscaping business a little bit more before he fully winds off off of that. But, um, you know, it's it's his vulnerability that, people are drawn to. And, and for me, you know, again, helping people build unlikely business owners, build businesses. I, I want to see Keith succeed in the speaker circuit because I, I think unlike anybody else, he brings that genuineness. Mm -hmm. That's just that everybody can relate to because we've all either been there or headed there. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> oh, Quentin. Thanks. <laughs> So to start your, your media, you've got to have a topic to talk about. So yours was landscaping. So at what point, like kind of what Joe just mentioned, do you leave that service business aside to pursue that but still have an audience that views you as credible because you have the experience of what knowledge they want to gain? Are you talking about the difference between making videos primarily focused on getting customers and marketing your business? versus also talking to people who do what you do and how do, where do those... Right, because I guess from what I understand, you're, you're like marketing to landscapers about how do you start a landscaping business and they yeah. say, hey, this guy's done it, he can teach me how to do it. Mm -hmm. So at what point are you say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be done with the landscape and just focus on that because you've got enough credibility to to show that you you know what you're doing? <laughs> well. Well, for you, I mean, what, what is, where do you see your future going as when would you leave the landscaping and just be able to pursue that full time? Oh, okay. So my first brand is the Landscaping Employee Trap. It's a whole YouTube channel with the product line and it's an entire, it, it, it created a movement that people say changed landscaping as a career to, of the ideas and concepts to, to get into it. It was like, uh, this is what they're saying. People say about it. Uh, but the entire thing was actually a huge beta test. It's been a five, six year long beta test. I wrote it all down and I plan, I'm going to start this thing called the landscaping employee trap. It's going to become the number one. Uh, when, when you type in the word landscaping on the word YouTube in 48 months, I'm going to be, I'm sorry, 24 months. I'm going, my name is going to be the number one name in the world synonymous with the word landscaping. So I made that happen. And then in the process, on the back end of learning how to do all that as, as a huge Petri dish experiment, by that time, 
I will understand how to actually do this and then move on to which, what I really want to do, which is uh, <sighs> coaching and consulting and help people get out of the entire nine to five trap and, and the suffering of being stuck as a victim in, in a dead end way. So which I'm doing now. So uh, to get out of it, at what point would I get out of it? When my passive income far exceeds that of, to the point where it doesn't even make sense to have a service business anymore. But so at that point you're doing more marketing and coaching on helping other people do the same thing as opposed to like just the landscape coaching. Yeah, so okay. going meta means to, I like going meta means, and it's a huge, I took this course by Eben Pagan. He's one of the top marketers in the world. It's called Accelerate. And they have this entire session about going meta. If you take water and you put it in a bottle, it's kind of going meta. Okay. And then you take that and you put it into a six pack. And then you take that water and you put it into a case. And then you take that case and you put it onto a pallet. And then you take all those pallets and you put it onto a truck. The more you step back is you can now teach people how to do what you've done, but you can teach people how to teach other people to do what you've done, and you can keep stepping back infinitum. So now I coach and I consult other internet marketers in our industry, and they actually pay me to teach them how to uh, implement internet marketing strategies into their businesses. And uh, one company I can't say because it's confidential, I coach them over a an eight-week period, and I watch their ROI just go like straight up they went from making like a couple grand a month to 30 grand a month within i was like eight weeks it was insane so i flew out i met with them and i was doing skype calls with them and it was like i was like wow i have this talent to teach people how to do marketing it's kind of like you can you can look at the fishbowl of your business and you can't see it but you can look at it someone else's and see it crystal clear so i think that's kind of the future for me is developing an entire packages for people where I fly out with Quentin and we shoot all their sales and marketing videos. It's like, you know, X amount of dollars and literally just lift up their whole company as far as marketing. Cool. Hope that answered the question. One more question and we're done. Anything else? Yeah, I do. Oh, wait, he's got one and then. Mine will be quick, I promise. Um, in terms of editing, do you do editing on the go or do you use like a desktop program like Adobe Premiere? This is a good question. I have all those programs, but um, Power Director Studio or iMovie Maker on your iPhone, I can go to an event. I take my micro SD chip inside of an SD adapter from my camera to my drone to my GoPro, whatever. I take the chip out, put it in my phone. And I edit on PowerDirector, so I can go sit in the corner of a live event and have a, a fully edited professional video with music and everything and titles up on YouTube live before anybody has even left the event and had a chance to go home and edit their videos like any other video maker. So I'm just crushing everybody because I do it directly on my cell phone. 90% of all videos are done directly on the mobile device. I, I actually have like three phones and a tablet. I'll edit one video while it's uploading. I'm editing another video while it's uploading. Like I won't use the bathroom. I won't eat for like eight hours straight. Just like in a complete insane, like like I was on a drug or something and content is just going up. The people at T-Mobile, I was on the phone with them and they literally said, what the hell are you doing? Because I'm running um, something like 150 gigabytes a month of data just going in and out. Like my phone is melting on the countertop. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. So the last question? Yeah, yeah last question. <laughs> oh. when, you, when you started this whole thing, um, you didn't necessarily have an end goal in mind, but for us, you made the comment, I want you to think about being a media company, a social media company first and a service business second. So uh, is it just the matter of volume of content that we're putting out? Make it valuable, make it what we are and make it who we are, but just get it out there? Or is it? It's another good question. So volume is extremely important now because it's relevant now that you have higher volume of content, but quality and relevancy really, really, really matters a lot because you, you pick out maybe three to five topics and you just stay in that and don't open up the Rubik's Cube or the paradox of talking about anything else. If you don't want to talk about your personal life, then don't. Don't share that. Share these same specific things and drill really deep on them and share a lot of it over time. But... 
<coughs> at first your content's gonna suck, but once you get good at it, you'll find out kind of like your niche and what you're good at. And yeah, a few years ago, you could put out a piece of content a week, but now so many people are doing it to cut through the noise. You have to put out decent to good content, which is authentic. So that's how you can shortcut good production by being authentic and put out a lot of it. There's people out there that are, there's something like 600 hours of videos being uploaded to YouTube every single minute right now as we speak. So um, it's kind of discouraging. It can be, but that's why I said build it until it becomes a habit and hits automaticity to where now you're just doing it throughout your day, you know. But there's huge white space in the service industry, right? So it's oh God, saturated by other YouTubers. Uh, but as far as like content creation, even one a week that you then distribute YouTube, Facebook, sh meme it, clip it down under 60 seconds, put it on Instagram. Like, yeah. Your distribution game is good. You can take a single recording and some rough video and, you know, once a week pump out a bunch of different pieces of content. Yes. And the only final thing, and then we're done, is a, sim a way to simplify this is uh, Brennan Burchard's circular virality strategy. You take one piece of content per week, and then you spend the week pushing that out as far as you can and syndicating that one piece of content. So you, instead of feeling rushed, you create one piece of good content, and then you push it out by creating a blog post article, by pushing that same message or that topic or that idea wide and far. And then that slows down the roll and it gets you kind of like out of first gear and puts you in a third or fourth gear so you can travel a lot faster. So, thanks. Well, thank you, Keith. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. What's up? I'm Keith Kelfis and I'm here with Joe Kowalski. He's the CEO of ServiceMonster.net. And it's a, it's a CRM that you can run your whole business off of. And I, I want to ask him a couple questions. We've been here for two days at his GROW symposium in, in beautiful Bellingham, Washington State. It's gorgeous out here. But uh, me, personally, I've learned so much in the, over the last two days from this guy and his team and everything that he's assembled. The culture is awesome. But specifically for you guys watching, I, I want to ask you, Joe, why is it so important to pay attention to implementing a, a CRM and this type of technology if you're a service business owner and tracking all this stuff? And then what, what does that look like going into the future and for all the people who do and don't do that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, it, it's interesting. Only about 35% of the industry, service industry, uses CRM of any kind. Uh, and so it's a massive competitive advantage because your bread and butter is going to be your repeat rate. You know, commercial work, that's obvious, it's built in, but residential work, working hard to get those clients in to only lose them on the backside, it's just a losing strategy. And so the difference between, let's say, a $200,000 business and a million dollar business, honestly, is simply a 35 to 40% spread in your repeat rate. Because if you can build that repeat rate, that's going to compound your growth over time. And a CRM tool is going to help you do that. Now, Service Monster is a little more than just a CRM too, right? We have three pillars like CRM or customer relation management is one, but we also have field service operations. Mm -hmm. So managing your schedule and where your trucks are going is a big deal because you don't make any money staring out of your windshield and gas isn't getting any cheaper. And so some of the things that we do helping you route and keep jobs close to each other really help save time and efficiency. And just in gas savings alone, it's really going to save you the 80 bucks in the general subscription. So, you know, it's a super affordable. So it's a super affordable product with all the features you're going to need. And then the third pillar is marketing automation, keeping in touch of your clients on a regular basis through automated, whether it's direct mail, whether it's uh, email or it's call campaigns or export campaigns with use for third party vendors, like maybe a uh, phone blasts or you know, things like Here, that, right? Can I see so, yeah, yeah. So, so your CRM, your software helps service business owners implement all this stuff and it happens on autopilot while they're working either in the field, on, while they're on the truck or off the truck. It helps them automate a lot of these processes in their business. And so as this technology evolves, and I know you, you spoke a lot at the event today, how you're implementing all these cool new cutting edge things that people can take advantage of. But for the people that don't take advantage of this technology, what is it going to look like for them in the next five years? And why do they need to jump on this immediately? Yeah, so um, the boomers kind of had a reprieve, 
right? The Gen Xers, there wasn't enough of us to kind of handle the succession required for the boomers businesses. And the boomers don't really like change that much. That's why that 35% CRM adoption is so low, right? But now the millennials are coming up and where the boomer would start a business, go to Target, buy a day planner and start a business. The millennials don't go to Target. They pick up their phone, they go to the app store and they download. And so from day one, they're running on data. They're running on analytics. They're creating custom systematized processes. They're eating the boomer's lunch on automation as a default starting point of their business. And that's a scary proposition for those who aren't taking advantage of this technology to stay in front and keep their clients their clients. And what's going to happen is those relationships for, of their clients are going to they're going to lose them and they're going to build relationships with companies that are utilizing social media and CRM technology and they're just going to be out in the cold. They're going to slowly lose their client base over time and they won't really understand what's happening. Okay. And then one more thing. So uh, for guys watching, whether you decide to uh, check out Joe's Service Monster or something else, uh, I, I just want you to say why why do they need to take action? Oh, we got some awesome birds over here. Um, can you can you give a couple points of of why it's important to to take action now, and maybe some of the things you experience from some of your users? Because you work with a lot of service industry providers, what are some of the objections or reasons why they feel like maybe they want to get started and start doing this, and and but they've got some things in the way. How do they get over that so they can dive in and start taking action? What are the first couple steps? I mean, it's a mindset shift to start with, right? Technology is a little scary, intimidating to a lot of people. Um, and so that fear will obviously be a barrier to entry. And then you can start to make excuses like, I've been successful this whole time and, and, I, and I need to change my mindset. But that's really hard when you're doing something that you're succeeding at. You just may hit a ceiling that you can't cross unless you take a different route. And unprogramming that is is tough. So having a good CRM um, and, and moving forward with that quickly, sooner rather than later, will help you keep your clients, your clients, will help you systematize your business and grow. Like the number one we complaint that we get all the time is, oh, I wish I would have done this so much sooner. Just because once you start actually doing it in your business, the light turns on like one piece at a time through each of the product's features and functions and the reporting. And you realize that, oh man, I I could have been, my life could have been so much easier, so much sooner. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. This has been an amazing time and you're going to have another one uh, next year. You think about first one yeah. and uh, the response has been phenomenal. Like, I don't think there's anyone here that wasn't blown away. So that's very encouraging. And I know that these guys are already talking about wanting to come back next year for accountability and kind of keeping each other in check. And so yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, if I can convince the accounting department to cut loose the funds, because yeah. we broke even on this one. I wasn't looking to make any cash. I was just looking to provide value and give a target towards our new team to grow and gel and get the experience of a trade show without having to attend one. So we just focused on delivering as much value as we could possibly pour out yeah. of our faces. And uh, and yeah, so yeah, I, I, I think that we're pretty excited about doing one next year. And you and your team has absolutely did provide a ton of value. And one of my my big takeaways as being part of the symposium today was I could feel that Joe and his team really, really actually genuinely cares about the success of everybody involved, in, including me. So that was a huge takeaway. So thanks a lot, Joe. Yeah, and thanks for coming to speak, man. You, your presentation was amazing. Like every Everybody there was like, they, you said all the things that, that I wanted to say, but I couldn't say it because I say them all the time. And having another person say this, and basically you outlined our entire game book, right? It was, it was, it was exactly what we do. And so that presentation really hit home for a lot of those guys. So thank you for being part and of it. I'll put a link in the description below to everybody. Tell everybody about your Service Monster show and where they can find it. Uh, so they can go on YouTube. Right, and look up Service Monster, all one word. Um, and there's an Ask Service Monster show that we do weekly. And we also do the Service Monster show, which is a weekly, just kind of behind the scenes look at what we do in our company, uh, which can help translate in, in your business and help make you a little bit better. Uh, and then we do showcase our uh, releases that we do about once every week. We release new product features and updates. Awesome. Thank you so much. And this is Joe Kowalski, the founder of ServiceMonster.net. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Heath. Later. Yeah, see ya.